I thought you might be interested to hear a little, a few words about the the unfolding of centering prayer as a practice. In other words, what is the psychological experience of doing centering prayer uh, regularly, every day, so far as we can? Uh, if you, it's impossible to do it twice a day, then you could make it a little longer in the morning, like double it, okay, 40 minutes, instead of 20. But the ideal is to, is to allow it to have effect on each half of the day, more or less. So let's suppose you've done this, as some of you have, for three, four, five, or six years, or longer. I don't think it has its full effect unless you really do it regularly because the effect is cumulative. The, the reservoir of silence begins to fill, to deepen, and, uh, and, uh, and to overflow into your experience of daily life. Uh, so let's suppose that we've done central prayer now for maybe five or ten years. And uh, what's our normal experience of the prayer uh, likely to be? Well, everybody is different and their rhythm is different. And the uh, Holy Spirit, uh, as the great therapist, uh, moves us along according to our state of life and our other duties. And, uh, and the time that we have at our disposal. One of my great hopes is that enough of, of people will start early enough in their lives so that when they came to retirement, you'd be able to spend the next 50 years or whatever you have. And, you would be, and we would develop a reservoir of contemplatives such as this world has never seen before. In our Western culture, at least, up until the last century, people normally lived to be only average age was in the 40s. It still is in some tragic places in the third world. But that means, suppose you retire at 65 or maybe a little earlier in the military or something. That means you'd have what corresponds to with the ordinary lifetime a few centuries ago to spend completely dedicated to contemplative prayer. You'd be in a better position than entering a convent or, or a monastery. You'd have all of this wonderful time to give and you could increase the time of prayer because your children are grown up and they don't need your so, so the elderly, in my view, are a reservoir of contemplatives that needs to be organized, slightly, not too much, but just enough. Because you could still do two periods of half an hour or even an hour and still get in 18 holes of golf. <laughs> or whatever you plan to do in your retirement. In any case, uh, let's, let's see what's, what happens. Because up till now, the number of those in the unitive consciousness, or unity consciousness, has been fairly rare, so rare that you never hear about them. And believe me, a lot of people besides the canonized saints have been in this space. It's just that it's such a wonderful place to be in that there should be more people enjoying this would see, and it would change the world. Uh, it would change the perspective in which people look at, at, at ordinary day-to-day -day life without changing its ordinariness. So, it, so suppose we're doing now this prayer and we introduce the sacred word, uh, Abba, or whatever you've chosen. And, and, and you notice 
there were a number of thoughts going by. You could have called them boats as a metaphor. Uh, some are very interesting, some are dull, some are ugly and unpleasant. And so you're experiencing a stimulation from these boats that are going by that uh, is stimulating the unconscious attachments that you may still have towards excessive security, power control, and, and approval. And, and by excessive, I mean very excessive. Right? Just think of some people you, you may know who, who like to control everything. You can't go to dinner without their ordering what they think you should have on the menu. You can't go anywhere without their changing all your plans. It has to be just the way they want it, or they feel abused, or that people don't love them anymore, and all the rest of it. Must, there's almost someone in your family or at work who has that temperamental bias. In fact, you might be such a person. <laughs> and you don't even see this, you know. That's why it takes sometimes a little challenge, a little illness, or a little contradiction, a few bankruptcies, several divorces, time in rehabs, finally on your deathbed, as doctors surround you with their sympathy and wringing their hands, you finally say, well, I guess my program is for happiness. We're not so hot after all. <laughs> We're offering a program to start finding this out a little sooner, sooner the better. Anyway, as, as you settle down, at some point you begin to notice that you're not interested in the thoughts going by. You, you really are establishing habitually a disregard of, of your thoughts, perceptions, external sensations. You notice them, but they don't have any influence on you. They're just part of reality of the moment that you're generally accepting without thinking about it. That's, that's the key to the uh, pra proper practice of, of centering. It's not a resistance to thoughts, still less an emotional reaction to them. It's simply a, a total disregard of them that is effortless. And the reason it's effortless is because you just aren't interested anymore. You're more interested and attracted towards the inmost center of your being, which you're getting more and more convinced is there, is waiting for you, is accessible. So some days you're forgetful and you're careless and you lose that sense. But most of the time, when you settle down and through most of the prayer, it's, it's there, it's refreshing. It's not extraordinarily consoling, but it's reassuring. It, it's, it's a sense that reality is good and that God is, is close. But God is not a thought or, a, or, or an image or any particular thing. It's just a presence that is indefinable, indescribable, but real. This is the God of pure faith. And, and this is as, perhaps as close as we come to who God really is in this life. In any case, what do you do when the thoughts are going by now and you know intuitively, not through a reasoning process, that you're not attracted to them? At least most of the time. Once in a while, there's always a star border that comes down the street. Uh, or something uh, very obnoxious that you can't help but notice. But noticing takes you out of the movement towards interior silence. So you pay the price for noticing both pleasant and unpleasant thoughts. Hence, the more prompt you are, this is what true concentration really is. It's simply promptness in letting go, not thinking about something but promptness in letting go of any thinking process at all around any particular object during the entire time of this 
prayer. So it's effortless. You don't decide to do this. You simply engage in the practice day after day patiently and, and expect to get bombarded. It's like being out in the rain without an umbrella. You're going to get wet. So you decide, well, I'm going to enjoy getting wet. I'm not going to let it bother me. So little by little, the fact that you don't let it bother you stops the rain. Because you just don't notice the thoughts anymore. So, so what is the advice then as this uh, development of a centric prayer unfolds? It really is a sign that you are a contemplative. You have become a contemplative. And don't feel bashful about saying it because it would be not humility to deny the gifts that God has given you at such a great price. Uh, the price of the incarnation and the Paschal mystery is, is, is God's sign or his signed proclamation that he's willing to go to any lengths whatsoever in order to give you the kingdom, if you will. And so, the, you already, the fact that you're not attracted or stimulated to think about any perception or thought or memory or plan is a sign that the Spirit of God has grasped your spiritual will. In other words, you have made the spiritual level of your being so, of so much a comfortable place to be in or to translate it into the terms that Jesus had. You've spent enough time in the inner room that you know what goes on there and you feel comfortable and you, and you spend the usual time without trying to squeeze extra consolations out of that experience. You, you have a certain freedom in going to the prayer and a certain freedom in ending it when the time is present regardless of whether it's consoling or not consoling. So freedom is a good sign of spiritual progress, inner freedom. And so what really has happened is that your, your union with God has begun in a very real way. And, and you wouldn't be able to disregard all the thoughts unless the spirit was holding, <coughs> gently holding your spiritual will and disinclining it think of anything else, but rather, and this is what the early uh, monks and the, some of the fathers of the church called resting in God, resting. Notice that in, in the Hebrew, rest, of course, is Sabbath. So this prayer is the fulfillment of what the Sabbath is supposed to be, the time in which God gives himself to us in such a way as to refresh us and prepare us for the week of labor, not necessarily to earn a living, but the labor of letting go of our attachments and of uh, letting go of hurting other people, letting go of our attachment to our emotional programs for happiness, excessive security, approval, and control. So, so we still have those feelings. We'd like to control this or that. But no sweat if we don't get it. In other words, it's like water off a duck's back. And this provides us with an enormous amount of energy that used to be wasted in pursuing these ephemeral programs for happiness that can now be used in loving other people, serving other people, remaining at peace and calm and not fighting with people. Marvelous use of energy to use it just for the service of God and others. Well, suppose the spirit, since he has your will in his hand during centering prayer now, holds you a little bit tighter. Now you, you know before you, you could only deduce it from the, from the results of, of its effects in your life. Now you have this inner sense that the spirit is present within you, is holding your will in, in the palm of, of God's hand. 
And sometimes this is an experience that wells up from deep inside. Sometimes it feels as though it was descending from above. Sometimes it is an experience of being surrounded by the love of God. Some symptoms of bodily kind sometimes go with this development. You may feel your extremities very heavy. They don't want to move. It's an effort to move them. You have an itch up here, you couldn't care less. It, it, it doesn't mean you can't scratch it, but it's, it's, you don't, there's something inside that doesn't want to lose this experience of Sabbath, of resting, of refreshment, of healing. And when your inmost nature is affirmed, you're always refreshed and liberated because all of us bring with us from early childhood a slew of self-doubts that can only be healed by the experience, repeated often, of affirmation. And so, as I said earlier, in the inner room, the symbol of turning off the tumult and noise of ordinary daily life, with the door closed, the symbol of turning off our interior dialogue with ourselves that normally goes on night and day. And finally, praying in secret, which is not to reflect on ourself or our experience during the time of prayer. Notice the enormous freedom that builds up as you follow Jesus' advice in a cascading movement into secret, into secret, into the deepest secret. And the deepest secret is when you're not thinking about yourself. And this is what St. Anthony the Great used to call perfect prayer. In other words, the perfect relationship with God is to stop thinking about yourself and your concerns, at least during the time of prayer, but to entrust yourself completely to the work of God, the divine parent. Well, the psychological effect of this deeper grasping is a deeper level of rest in which, in which the will is, is aware of God's presence most of the time and doesn't, is, is if anything, is a little afraid of being pulled out of it by some thought going by. And so as St. Teresa of Abila, again, a great expert in the experience of of stages of, of mysticism says that uh, when this happens we should treat the imagination as the ravings of a mad person. So when you're bombarded with thoughts just think you're living with a mad person for the time being and ignore it, ignore it. Nobody's asking you to think about these things, to weigh them or to judge them just to put up with it. And by putting up with it, you allow the will to rest, even though the other faculties are sometimes wandering all over creation, looking for something to do because they can't take part. Their nature doesn't allow them to take part in this spiritual banquet of divine love that is welling up from a well that has no bottom within us. That's the divine presence is boundless, endless, and is always there. So this St. Teresa calls the prayer of quiet. Notice quiet is quite close to the word rest. Quies. And you find some references to this state of prayer in the Psalms and in the Gospel. And Remember Jesus says to the disciples, come apart and rest a while. Or again, come to me all you who labor, especially in the spiritual journey, and are heavily burdened with all kinds of wild, extravagant thoughts, and I will give you rest. Learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your soul. So there's no doubt that Jesus wants to give us 
this rest, because it's in that rest that we begin to share his experience of Abba as loving, tender, infinitely merciful, forgiving, reconciling, and ready to give us a billion chances, if you live long enough, to enter ever deeper into the divine interior life itself. Okay, well suppose the spirit pull, tightens his grip a little bit more on your spiritual will. Then you experience what Sarita, Teresa actually calls the prayer of union. And at, in this prayer, you can't think. That is to say, God, Spirit, suspends temporarily the usual activity of the imagination and the memory so that you're able to enjoy without any hindrance the deep rest in love uh, that the spiritual will is enjoying. Notice the, the incredible consideration of God, the, the tenderness of motherly, thoughtful character. So in other words, God must feel sorry for all the wear and tear we put up with, with our extravagant thoughts going by. And eventually says to himself, let's give the guy a break. Let's give this gal just a few minutes of enjoying me to the full. And so he just stops your, your thinking apparatus and your rational apparatus so that they can't bother you. How thoughtful. Who would have thought of that? Well, anyway, it shows his great concern for what you're going through. What you're suffering is not his intention. It's simply the inevitable result of being a human being coming into this world and uh, with the human condition, something that he insisted that his only beloved son have to, has to do too. Again, remember that parable. Incredible insight into God. Whatever you suffer, God is, is he promising to take it away, but to join you in your distress, humiliation, and pain. And I suggest this is a greater gift than taking it away. Because now you're in union with God and you begin to see that in some way all suffering is in God and that when you're suffering anything, bodily, mental, moral, on any level, spiritual, God has joined you and is bearing it with you. And the symbol of that is Christ and his passion and death. So there's nothing to worry about. God is so close, whatever hurts a little bit is going to be for your glory forever and ever. And so uh, you begin to take a different view towards suffering and pain, disaster, not that they don't remain, some of them terribly harrowing. But the, the emotional response that leads to the feeling of impossible situations disappears. And so you no longer complain about God's treatment when you suffer. You no longer are worried about the suffering of the innocent. You try to prevent it, but you realize that the most innocent uh, being in the entire universe has taken all suffering, so to speak, into God's self. Uh, so that somehow it's all going to come out okay. God can suffer, we can suffer. And actually, God suffers in us. There's no doubt about that. And so, for that very reason, maybe that's why he wants to give himself a break once in a while and to caress us with the incredible tenderness of the divine heart. And if you've read the mystics, it's unbelievable the kind of intimacy that God is prepared to have with us and don't think it's just reserved to special people. It isn't. Remember, you, just you, are everybody else. 
who ever existed on some level of your spiritual being and everybody else is you. So that what now the modern physicists tell us that you can't have a thought without affecting the whole universe and its structure. That's almost more religious view of reality than I've ever heard from any religion, except maybe the Buddhists. But if you look hard enough, it's in, it's in our tradition too, in, in, in the wisdom sayings of Jesus. If you understand them, not so much from a ritual perspective as we've been kind of trained to do for centuries, but from the perspective of higher levels of consciousness or faith or love, which Jesus seems to apply, imply, especially in the Gospel of St. John and his last discourse. In any case, uh, it's possible for the spirit to hold you even tighter. In, in the prayer of union, one is aware of being in union with God. Okay? But you can't think about anything else, so the union is, is, is total. I mean, it's, it's full, it takes over all your awareness. But there's a further stage <clears throat> where you, the union is so profound that you forget yourself altogether and you don't even know you've been in divine union until it's over. But then you know where you've been because you're, you're the, the light life and the love that is left behind from that experience orientates you completely towards the love of God and his concerns, her concerns, if you prefer that terminology. And so God is, has proven finally his closeness and so in effect through the loving mercy of God, God has, has brought this person back to the Garden of Eden is not a place, but a, but a state of awareness in which one realizes one's intimacy with God, as Adam and Eve allegedly were doing in the garden. In fact, remember, God used to visit them, according to the story, in the evening, play games with them, I suppose, or had tea or something else. The, the, the closeness of God then begins to be a conviction. And oddly enough, it's precisely at that point that those who experience uh, this exuberant mysticism lose it because of the secret attachments that, that may develop as a result of so much delight and love and reassurance that uh, that God, who never wearies of purifying our love, takes it all away in what is called the night of spirit, in which uh, not only are our programs for happiness uprooted once and for all, and one dies to self, thus fulfilling our baptismal promise of dying to the false self, but one enter and, and rising with Christ and experiencing the inner resurrection that I've just described in various stages of intensity. Uh, but now you realize that God is just as present in the sense of his absence as he is in his presence, however restful, reassuring, and wonderful. Now you are be really beginning to find out what reality is like. That is to say, it's not like anything we imagine. It's not just a consolation. It's rather the ability to, to accept God's will, whatever that is, with equal delight, satisfaction, and acceptance. In other words, it's more than acceptance. It's a welcoming of reality, just as it is. And so there's no more difficulty in accepting oneself as one is. Maybe you are just a bum. So what? Well, Jesus, those are the people who got into the banquet. So you can feel reassured. 
Suppose you have an addiction that resists every kind of medical or other treatment. God still loves you. If you have an addiction, moral responsibility is, is virtually nil. There's only the responsibility to try to take what measures are reasonable to recover. So it may be that God likes to feel your human misery, likes to share the, the terror perhaps, or the infirmity, or the humiliation, or the rejection, or the abandonment that you may receive as a result of your personal problem. This God of ours is incredibly humble. He must be. Otherwise, why would he have made us? A creator could certainly have done better than that, I would think. I speak for myself. Here we are, a bunch of very sick people. If you don't believe that, just remember your catechism in which the consequences of original sin are listed as three, remember? Illusion, we don't know where true happiness is. Concupiscence. We look for happiness in the wrong places. Three, if you ever find out where happiness is to be found, the will is too weak to do anything about it anyway, without grace. I suggest that a person with that syndrome is a very sick person. But I don't want to insult anyone here. I know you're very advanced. But oddly enough, the more advanced, the more you're convinced of how sick you are. <laughs> so it's just the reverse of what you expect. But now being sick doesn't bother you anymore. You don't care how, what a wretch you are and so on. Because you know that the more helpless you are, the more God loves you. And, and this is not my doctrine, dear people. This is the teaching of the great doctor of the church, St. Therese of Lisieux. Read her letters, her stuff. This is what she says all the time. I, she says, I accept for the love of God the most extravagant thoughts I get during prayer. So she has them, but it doesn't bother her. This is the difference between her advanced stage and, and us as we start out from the beginning. Or again, she says, if I had on my conscience every conceivable crime, I would lose nothing of my confidence. My heart breaking with love, I would throw myself into the arms of the Father, Abba, and I know that I would be well received. No fear, in other words. No fear whatsoever based on on anything that she did or could do. And that's the nature of theological hope. It does not rely on our past good deeds and it does not worry about our past misdeeds. It's totally present to the God who is really only fully present in the present moment. And it's, our, it's where you are right now, this moment that God is looking at. He doesn't see anything else. So if you're totally turned to God at this moment, no matter if you've been totally turned in the opposite direction up until now, that's the end of it. That's the end of it. God has no memory for our past misdeeds. And hence, one of the unfortunate consequences of thinking of God as a, as a just judge is that it, it misses the invitation which is the invitation of sheer mercy to enter into the kingdom any time you want. That is, any time you're willing to accept the invitation and go to the dining hall with the other moms and enjoy the divine largesse. There is no room for pretension in the kingdom of God. There are no celebrities, there are no big shots, there are no levels of social status in the kingdom of heaven. 
and not at least according to the parables. Everyone is equal and everyone is, receives precise proportion of our love. Love is all that counts. And hence, the motivation with which you do things is what God is watching, not as a policeman, but with the hope of receiving a little more love. And if you finally decide you can't do it, then he'll give you, as St. Therese said, his own love with which to love him. Well, anyway, I was talking about the psychological experience of this uh, centering prayer as it evolved. And uh, speaking specifically of the night of spirit in which our idea of God is purified and the human props that supported our faith, our hope, and our charity are gradually liberated from the false self system and from all selfishness. So I just finished speaking of hope where we, we don't rely on our deeds or we don't worry about our misdeeds anymore. We simply are present to the God who is infinitely merciful and infinitely powerful. Hence, there's absolutely no excuse for not trusting God boundlessly again, the teaching of St. Therese. What St. Therese rediscovered in our time, it seems to me, is the essence of the contemplative path, which is to become uh, like little children. That's why she called it the little way. It's not childishness, but it's the spontaneity of the love of a child for a, a Abba who has proved him, Abba self, to be absolutely unlimited in trustworthiness and concern and goodness. So again, the dark night, which is so painful to some people, dark night of spirit at least, is actually the work of the Holy Spirit, the healing, the, the highest gift of the divine therapy uh, and liberates us completely so that the old self, as Paul calls it in his epistles, the old man is, is completely dismembered, that is to say, is unfolded, unwound, and, and the new man, that is the true self, begins to manifest. And what does the true self manifest the mind of Christ, Christ's attitude towards things. And, and these are specifically manifested in the fruits of the Spirit. Hence, you do well, dear friends, to, to look at the doctrine of the fruits and gifts of the Spirit. Uh, I do, I think that I've treated them in a book that's available, not that I'm trying to sell books, but I wouldn't mind. Uh, there, there is a description of the fruits there. And, and if you're doing centering prayer, you would normally begin to manifest those dispositions after a few years, if not sooner. And the Beatitudes are simply more profound movements of the Spirit within us that involve closer conformity to the pattern set by Jesus in his life teaching and especially in his passion, death, and resurrection, and his sense of, of unity with the whole of humanity. God wills everyone to be saved, according to Paul. Personally, it seems to me, since God is all-powerful, he'll succeed in doing so. In any case, whatever the discussion about those issues is that exercise theology. The spiritual journey continues to unfold. Actually, the, the, the full Christian life is the transforming union where one 
is aware all the time of being in union with God. And so this is the place where, where the prayer ceases to be confined to the time of prayer and keeps manifesting itself throughout daily life, even in the most ordinary occupations. And, and this, this is what the little way really means, that whether you're cooking, or brushing your teeth, or having a cup of tea, or calling someone on the phone, soul that one, everything is coming out of the love of God. And, and the love of God has, is so much a part of your own being that you don't even have to mention the name of God. It's obvious to everybody, except maybe you, if you don't think of it, that, that God is, is reaching out to people all the time through you and touching them in ways that you, you don't bother to think about. So that if anybody thanks you, you realize that they're talking about God, not about you, and so you pay no attention to praise and such and such things because you, you can't do it anymore because you know that God has liberated you from the selfishness that plagued you for years and years and years and interfered with all your your relationships with God with yourself and with other people and with the cosmos um, there's there's a, another experience that I think would be helpful because it's one that is very common to those who are doing centering prayer. And it's what Don of the Cross calls the night of sense. It, it takes place at an earlier period than the night of spirit does. It takes place about the same time that you experience that first grasping of the spirit that I described at the beginning of this particular talk. Remember we said you're aware of not being interested in the thoughts because the spirit has grasped your will even though you have thoughts you just have no inclination to think about your perceptions normally of course there are exceptions to every situation depending on what state of mind or what difficulties you may be in externally. But the night of sense is something you enter into quite quickly if you're doing centering prayer. And it's a period of dryness that is quite prolonged, some people longer than others. And sometimes one is in and out of that night, or at least it's more intense at certain times in your life than in others. It doesn't interfere normally with daily life. But it, it, it moves you beyond the springtime of the spiritual life when the spiritual exercises were refreshing, benefit, benefited you, and you felt profit from spiritual reading, the reading of scripture, reception of the sacraments, uh, ministry, good deeds, and so on. Now, it, it's not that any of this is wrong. We have to try to do these things in order to find out that even in those good deeds, there is mixed motivation, that the false self has simply shifted its interest in symbols of security in the environment, or of power, control, or of approval, to a more respectable milieu. It hasn't died at all. And so we need the night of sense and a long period of dryness to help us to see that all our good deeds that we thought were impressive and that seem to impress others are, are really like dirty dish rags under the gaze of the divine perspective. And so, so, so God makes it impossible for us to do them with any pleasure so that they become hard, grinding work. And so it, it's a time when to sit down and centering prayer is tough tough going. It seems like more work than climbing a mountain. Get yourself to sit down and do it. But actually this, this kind of therapy is absolutely marvelous and is perfectly adapted to our problem, which is an unwillingness to 
let go of our hope that we can find happiness in one of our programs, the happiness that we brought with us from early childhood and which are basically childish or infantile, if you prefer. Most people in this society are operating out of fairly childish motivation, either the programs or the over-identification with one's group that comes during the years from four to eight when we unquestionably absorb the attitudes and values of our peers or our teachers or our parents or our religious leaders and so on. So it, it, what God does then is, is send us the night of scent which is a long period of dryness in which the virtue is a great effort and which we no longer find satisfaction or apparent benefit, apparent benefit, I say. Actually, we're experiencing enormous benefit because the experience of our weakness helps us to get over our judgment of ourselves as better than others. We don't compete with others in fasting or in how many rosaries we say or, or in, uh, in our good works. In other words, it, it frees us from the selfishness that sneaks into even spiritual good works until one has put, God has put you through this treatment. And it's the result of the gift of knowledge, one of the seven gifts of the Spirit. And it's the first one that manifests itself significantly and it goes like this. It tells you intuitively, not through reason, that only God can satisfy your desire for happiness. This immediately changes our perspective and undermines our expectations or our false hopes of finding happiness in one of those programs or in being accepted by some group, ethnic, national, religious, peer group, and so on. Gangs are the classical example of finding their meaning there for life and being accepted by the group to such an extent that they'll, they'll commit terrible crimes in order to be accepted. But we also will go to great lengths to be accepted by a group from whom we expect to find our identity and meaning. And this is childhood. So, so the Spirit of God, with his resentless desire to help us to grow up, to be fully human, and to then move on to become divinely human, takes away all possibility or all hope of finding happiness in security, affection, esteem, and approval, and power and control. And so you're plunged right away into depressing thoughts because we always experience grief when something we love goes away. That's the natural reaction. So when there's no hope of finding happiness in our security systems, then you feel sad, depressed, and this is increased by the experience of dryness and so forth. But actually, the whole of our fault self system is undermined by this gift. Because now you know what true happiness is. So that illness of original sin that consists in an illusion is gone. Now you're beginning to get some truth and some light into your life. And, and you can't help but experience in due time enormous sense of liberation and inner freedom. And the availability of all this new energy, much of which will improve your health. Because one of the causes of a lot of people's illnesses is the amount of energy they waste in pursuing frustrating programs for happiness that cannot possibly work. And then hours of frustration and emotional binges about the consequences. So, so the night of the sense for many people, it seems in our culture, is extensive much longer than the night of spirit. You could be in it for 20 years, more or less. So don't run away too soon. The best is yet to come. 
but it, it, it's important to realize that some of these processes, because of our state of life or our state of mind or our state of illness, requires time. Otherwise, if God hastened it, we might be frightened and run away before the treatment is completed. And so God tempers the treatment to each of our needs individually. But it, it's precisely at the moment that you think all is lost and that the, the contemplative life is for the Trappists or other cloistered people. You have children to educate and uh, business to carry on. This couldn't be meant for, for me. Baloney. It, it's part of the baptismal gift. You have an engraved invitation with baptism for transformation into Christ. That's the meaning of the ritual or the symbol, death and resurrection. You physically don't die in baptism. It's the false self that you equivalently commit to death in the baptismal pool and, and rise into the inner resurrection that Jesus provides. So, so all the sacraments and their theology and meaning are interrelated with scripture and with the contemplative prayer. But it's contemplative prayer that alerts you to this interrelatedness and you begin to see all the mysteries of our religion as interrelated and meaningful and, and astonishing in their organization and genius. And you realize this God is really somebody He's really big. And we've got to think big about God. He's not picky or worried about details.